welcome to Futures, Connection and Faith with Leila Abulela and Nadine Aisha Jasset. I'm Jill Stevens from Interfaith Scotland and I will be chairing today's event. This event is part of Book Week Scotland 2020 Digital Festival in collaboration with Interfaith Scotland. From November 8th to the 15th, we had Scottish Interfaith Week, through which we celebrated the nation's religious and cultural diversity with events held by communities across Scotland. The theme of Scottish Interfaith Week was connecting. Today, we're here as part of Book Week Scotland, which is a national celebration of all things reading and writing. This year's theme for Book Week Scotland is future. So today we will be discussing faith, future and connection. We hope you enjoy this event. First, hi, Leila and Nadine. Would you both like to introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about how your, your writing relates to our themes of faith, future and connection? And Leila, would you like to go first? Okay, um, so my name is Leila Abolela. I've written five novels and a collection of stories, short stories. Um, all of my novels are very much related to, um, to being a Muslim and especially to being a Muslim in, in the West and in, in Scotland. I've written about that in um, my first novel, The Translator and Minaret and the latest novel, uh, Bird Summons. Summon. So this is really a theme that's uh, quite uh, close uh, to, to, to my heart and it, it, it figures in different way um, uh, throughout my fiction. Thank you, Leila. Nadine? Hi, I'm Nadine Aisha Jasset and I'm a poet and a writer and author of Let Me Tell You This which is my first poetry collection and also a contributing author to It's Not About the Burqa, which is an essay collection from Muslim women speaking in their own words and on their own terms. Um, I think faith in my writing is something that in my first collection comes through in like quite small and, and lovely ways, but in my sort of current um, top secret <laughs> uh, writing, it's actually a theme that's emerging more and more. Um, and certainly I was part of the Outriders Africa um, work with Edinburgh International Book Festival earlier this year. And I went back to Zimbabwe where my, my father's family are from. And that was a huge place of faith and connection for me in that experience. So a lot of my writing that I'm doing just now is really about faith and connection coming together. So really lovely to be talking about it today. Thank you, Nadine. I was wondering if we could maybe have a little excerpt from both of your writings, if you'd be happy to read out something. Um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna read uh, from uh, my first uh, novel, the, the Translator. And it's about this Muslim uh, widow who, who lives in Aberdeen. And um, she starts to uh, fall in love with a Scottish uh, academic. So this section that I'm reading describes her um, a, day at, a day at work in the university because she works as a, as a translator. In the afternoon, she went to pray in the small university mosque, a room given over to the Muslim students. It was in another building, older and more beautiful than the modern building where her own department was. She found the room dark and empty. She switched on the lights, took off her shoes and felt eerily alone in the spacious room with its high ceilings. When it was crowded during term time, everyone just prayed on the carpet, but now she took one of the mats that was folded on a shelf and spread it out. It was blue, plusher than the one she had at home and with a picture of the Kaaba under a navy sky. There was more reward praying in a group than praying alone. When she prayed with others, she found it easier to concentrate, her heart held steady by those who had faith like her. Now she stood alone under the high ceiling of the ancient college, began to say silently, all praise belongs to Allah, Lord of the world, the compassionate, the merciful, and the certainty of the words brought unexpected tears, something deeper than happiness, all the splinters inside her coming together. When she finished praying, she looked at the notices on the notice board, the prayer timetable, the dates of meetings of the interfaith group, a talk on Jerusalem with a speaker coming up from St. Andrews. She walked back to her room through the wet gardens of the campus. Being outdoors in the fresh air was a break in the day. It was colder than it had been in the morning. On days when D Diane was not in, Samar prayed in the room, lock locking the door from inside. 
She had an old shawl which she kept in the drawer of her desk and used as a prayer mat. It had seemed strange for her when she first came to live in Scotland, all that privacy that surrounded praying. She was used to seeing people praying on pavements and on grass. She was used to praying in the middle of parties, in places where others chatted, slept or read. But she was aware now, after having lived in this city for many years, she could understand how surprised people would be were they to turn the corner of a building and find someone with their forehead, nose and palms touching the ground. She wondered how Ray would feel if he ever saw her praying. Would he feel alienated from her? The difference between them accentuated, underlined, or would it seem to him something that was within reach, something that he himself would want to do? Thanks. That's beautiful, Leila. Thank you. Okay. Nadine, would you like to give a little reading? And you're still on mute at the moment. Sorry, I was just singing Layla's praises. Oh. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was that was so beautiful. But also just because we're talking about like faith and connection as well. And um yeah, just sort of hearing you reading and the imagery that you were reading and sort of feeling that that sense of connection to what you were saying as well was really lovely. Um thank you. <laughs> Um, but I shall I shall read so I'm going to read a short poem and then a, a really short extract um, as well so this poem Anti is about my aunt um, and yeah I think for me and I, I say this sort of in the extract the relationship between faith and family is really um, inseparable I guess for me in terms of yeah yeah I think it's, it's quite inseparable it's connected to to people and and place especially. So um, this poem is called Auntie, oh, let me tell you this. Auntie. My aunt's hands are soft and brown and they smell like cumin and coriander. She is a gardener in the kitchen. Auntie, I remember your skin the way some people remember the bus route. I know I need to trace it to go home. The world of work, bus bells and sirens are harsh alarm clocks. I would rather wake gently in 5 a.m. light to your softly whispered duas, welcoming the morning. Um, so I wrote that poem, I was gonna say in 2018, but I was like, no, it was much, much before then. It was more like 2014, 2015, um, when I'd, I'd just been visiting family abroad. And then I came back to Edinburgh and I was living on Leith Walk and there was all these noises of the sirens and the busyness. And, you know, I'd been used to waking up at 5 a.m. to the sound of like my auntie whispering in Arabic. And it was just this, this feeling of peace that I wanted to transport with me, um, that I wanted to bring in the poem. And then, a short extract, so you're getting poetry and prose from me, two for one. <laughs> um, I wanted to read a wee bit from my essay, and it's not about the burqa, which is called, the essay is called Daughter of Stories, and it's about how I learned what I meant to be a Muslim woman based on the stories of the women in my family. And so just before this extract, I talk about being at primary school, and I, I describe sort of being in the little checked dress with the daisies and being told by another child because my mum is Christian my dad's Muslim saying are you Muslim or Christian you can't be nothing and feeling like I, I didn't exist and so then reflecting on this as an adult. I'd been raised to identify as Muslim but as an adult I didn't really practice. I had developed like many people both outside and inside Islam my own sense of spirituality which felt unique and personal However, I still knew that Islam was a thread running through my identity, woven within like the many lessons and experiences that had shaped me and my life. It was present in family, in familiar and shared practices. It was at the heart of many of my key values and frames of reference. Islam is a part of who I am, a part of my story. Consequently, to be told by others that I was not Muslim enough or that my existed existence lingered dangerously over a nothing I couldn't be, felt as if I was being pushed directly into that nothing, denying not only my existence, but also my connection to my family, my heritage and my story. Family storytelling was an antidote to this dismissal, a way of preserving my heritage in a world where that connection was constantly challenged. 
However, it seems clear to me that many of the connections to Islam, which I hold dear today, are the ones I gained from family. An inheritance of whispered words held like muscle memory. The fact that I love you is only the first half of the sentence, always completed with the words, may Allah bless and keep you. And the remembrance of Ma, my grandmother who gave and helped those in need always. Simply put, Stories of Ma helped me to understand Islam, and Islam helped me to understand her, her values, her life, what she lived by. I cannot unpick my sense of who I am in relation to Islam from the thread of being a part of Ma, of Aunt, her sister, and my wider family. Even my name, the Aisha, which sits proudly in the middle, proclaims not only my connection to the faith so close to my heart, but also to Ant, the Aisha who came before me and who I am named after, the heroine of so many of my favourite family tales. Even in my name, there is a story. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Nadine. <laughs> that was lovely. Yeah. So much about connection as well in that. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's really interesting the developing an outside and inside Islam and that connection being challenged. Um, I was wondering if you want to talk about that a little bit more. So just in the context of, like I said, in the essay of that, that playground sort of rule that I was given by that girl. And when you are a child, right, you, you're so often um, thinking in, in set ways, I guess. And yeah, she said, you, you know, you can't be Muslim and Christian. You can't be both. You can't be nothing. Um, and I think it really set up this idea of, that I couldn't choose all the different parts of my identity and upbringing and, and faith and self and, and make it unique to me. When in fact, I think in practice, and this is something that I've learned directly from the Muslim women in my life, you can make faith exactly exactly yours. And Leila, does that resonate with you as well, with your writing? Um, well, I think with, with, the, with my writing, it's, it's about uh, connecting as a Muslim with the, the, the non-Muslim uh, that, 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 that make up the most of, the, of course, the population of Scotland and of you know, Britain and, um, and of the Western world. So it's um, these, these characters that I write about there, they exist at this time of you know the 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 war on terror the rise of islamophobia and 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 so they're they're living in this really um kind of fraught situation where there's this tension and whether the tension is is um uh, personal between you know them and another, and another character or whether it's a kind of a community t tension it's there very much in 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 the fiction and um it kind of like drives the, 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 the fiction so that even if you're writing, uh, if, if I'm writing something very ordinary, uh, because of the, of the backdrop, backdrop, it just seems to be somehow charged and people then feel that it is, it, it's political. It's, it's almost, it, it sounds political, but that is because, um, not, in itself it isn't, but it's because of the backdrop that, 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 that makes it somehow become like that. Um, and do you feel that the topic of interfaith or the relationship between different beliefs and cultures influences your writing in that way that you were talking about, some sort of charged background? Um, yeah. So how does interfaith relate to your writing? Well, I think it, 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 it does, of course. I mean, I, I grew up... Um, in Sudan, I went actually to a Catholic school, which in which most of the girls were Muslim. So I came into contact with Christians at a very young age, and I had I had Christian friends, and there was a lot. There was, you know, there's an Sudan had a a Christian kingdom in Nubia uh, before Christianity reached uh, Europe. So there's an indigenous, you know, uh, Chris, uh, Christians in 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 Sudan and in Ethiopia and. And, and, and uh, so the, that that, uh, that who feel that they are both Christian and and, and African and, and and some of them are Arab. So I grew up with these people around me. But so when I came to to Britain, I thought that the Christians I meet in Britain would be the same. But they're very very different. There's a huge difference between Christians in the West and Christians in Africa and in the rest of the world. 
and uh, and somehow uh, Christianity in, in in the West is uh, is um, is kind of like um, shrinking. It's 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 fading, and and uh, and uh, the, the 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 vigor and the energy is coming from Christians, whether they're coming from you know Poland or whether they're coming from Africa. And um, and this is something that has uh, brought um, you know that had come with immigration with the waves of, of immigration, so somehow I feel um, you know that, that that I have more in, I have a lot in common with uh, you know as as a Muslim I have a lot in common with the Christian immigrants who are coming into into Britain as well and and all of us seem to be coming uh, to pray and to worship in a place where people. Uh, don't seem to be doing that so much you know people have become so secular and so um shy of speaking about their faith and uh and 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 you know it's it's not how it was um you know a, a long time ago what would your hopes be for for um, faith in the future um well, I hope that there would be more uh, spaces for people to talk about faith and to exchange ideas and to ex exchange experiences. I think that the, the secular, um, uh, the atmosphere is very strong and it kind of suppresses any any talk of, 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 of faith. In, and uh, um, so it's... it's um, it's 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 uh, it's kind of I was I was actually told that it's easier to speak about faith if you're a Muslim than you, if you are than you are in a, as a Christian that people are actually in certain circles people will actually allow you to speak more than than a, a Christian would to speak so you do feel that way and sometimes um, I get I do get comments from Christian readers um, in the case of my novel for example the translator it's about this uh, love story between this Muslim woman and a and a, and a not non-practicing Christian and he converts at the end to, to marry her and, and and some Christians say to me well we won't we wouldn't get, get away with writing this kind of novel but you got away with it because you're a Muslim yeah so it's uh, it's to do with the dominance of the secular um, you know atheist uh, you know climate yeah. thank you Leila and um, Nadine um so regarding interfaith relations, would you describe your family as an interfaith family and what has your experience of interfaith um, influenced your writing? Yeah, I think I think I always would have said we were mul like multi-faith, but I think that's just like a, a difference of language rather than meaning. Um, yeah, so I, and again, I talk about this in the, um, it's not about the book I say, of, uh, you know, being lucky that I got Christmas and Eid um, you know, together as a kid. So I was like, yes, double the present, you know. Though obviously this year, you know, it's double the um, being alone during key celebrations as well. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that that was definitely, um, yeah, I think the multi-faith presence was a part of me growing up. But also I think in terms of where I grew up was a very multi-faith place, you know. Um, and, you know, we we would make it was important to sort of acknowledge and celebrate with all of the folks in our community for a variety of different faith celebrations like Diwali for example um so it was really it was really present I guess in me growing up and when I was at um college or sixth form when I did A levels I did um like philosophy religion and ethics it was called but sort of religious studies and theology I guess just because I loved it just as a geek I loved it and I found it so interesting what what different people believe and connect to around the world um you know because I think it for me I'm so interested in people's feelings and and people's hearts I guess but also the the power of faith and belief and how personal that is so I I've just found it really interesting as a person as well okay um do you view writing as a kind of spiritual or cathartic process and if so how do you feel that process impacts your writing Leila? Would you like to? Um, uh, not really. I wouldn't say that. I'm very, uh, I'm very conventional. I mean, for me, uh, spirituality is religious practice. Is you know, is very. Uh, 
uh, the, 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 you know, the conventional way of praying, the conventional way of fasting, reading the Quran, and the writing is, is kind of is worldly to me. The writing is, is about human beings. It's about human feelings. And that's very much a worldly thing. It's, it's uh, yes, of course, I, I try and write, I do write about spirituality, but it's still it's still human somehow. Um, and, and, and so it's 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 uh, it's kind of got it's um, uh, it's not angelic. It's, it's 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 human. It's got human flaws and human you know uh, human failings in it. So that's how I uh, how I see it. Yeah. Nadine, how would you find you find it a cathartic process writing? Um, I was actually just thinking about. I love that. Um, I love that description that Layla just said about it's angelic, not angelic, but <laughs> human flaws and human failings. Um, I like that. Um, but I, so I think for me, there's, I feel like it's often um, an age old question about writing being cathartic. And also for me, I think there's like a really big difference between what we, what is written and what is published, you know, because obviously that, that for me, those are at least two different things, you know, what I, the things that I might write in those cathartic moments might be quite different or might be the same as what gets published. You know, it just, especially with poetry, you know, it really just depends on the wider narrative that you then bring into a collection. But in terms of writing as spiritual, um, I think for me, you know, as I as I said in my reading earlier, for me, like my sense of my own spirituality is so um, unique to me and personal that I feel like if I put it, you know, if I wrote it down on paper and presented it to somebody, they might or might not necessarily connect it to Islam or another spiritual, you know, I don't know. I don't know what they would connect it to because it feels like, you know, if we're talking about interfaith and multi-faith, it feels like my own spirituality is something that I've I've drawn from so many different um, experiences, I guess, and and brought into me, including the specific magics that that go on in my family as well. You know, um, so for me, poetry in particular is is very spiritual, um, and I've often talked about Mary Oliver, the the nature poet. Um, well, much more than you know, a nature poet, but an everything poet really for me. Um, for, for me, when I read her work, I find it deeply, deeply spiritual and, and restoring in a really specific way. Yeah. Um, so your poetry is very personal. How do you feel when you reread your own poetry? Do you feel more connected with yourself? Or do you ever find dissonance or disconnection when you read your work? Maybe. Um, sometimes I laugh because I'm like, oh, did I like that? <laughs> You know, or you know, when you like, especially in the sort of publishing process where you'll write something, but it won't be published until like a time after. And so you kind of think, well, I'm just going to have to trust past Nadine. <laughs> that what she wrote the script. Um, but no, I think it's, I think for me, poetry has always been about connecting. Um, and I think when I wrote, let me tell you this, the sort of Angela Davis quote about walls being turned sideways at bridges was really in my mind, um, both in terms of exactly as Leila said earlier about recognizing that we're living in a context where racism and Islamophobia um, are present. And for me, I was like, I wanted to write, well, I wanted to write poems that related my experience and be like, look, this is what I'm living with, you know, and sort of kind of smash that wall and be like, this is what I'm living it with and, and you should listen, you know, are you invited to listen? <laughs> um, and then, but also in the other way, I said, I think just in terms of the power of sharing your experience, especially when it's something that you're often told not to talk about, um, or especially when part of your experience has been feeling silenced or, or like your voice hasn't been heard. And for me, poetry was a way of sharing that experience and opening these bridges of connection between people. Um, so yeah, a, a bit of both, a bit of the political, like we need to talk about this and a bit of the personal, like I'm opening <laughs> my heart to you. <laughs> I like the bridges of connection I think that's really interesting um, and Leila so are there any characters that you've written but you feel strong connection to or have you found yourself connecting with any of your own characters who you didn't expect to resonate with um, well the, my the my latest novel which is uh, Bird Summons it's about these uh, group uh, three Muslim women who go and visit the, grade, the grave of Lady Evelyn Cobalt who um, in the Highlands and uh, Lady Evelyn Cobalt was this, uh, uh, you know, Scottish aristocrat who 
um, shot deer and uh, she, you know, she lived this amazing life where she grew up in Cairo and traveled to Kenya. And she was the first uh, European woman to, uh, to do the pilgrimage in Mecca and she came back and wrote about it. So the book is all about these, uh, how these Muslim women uh, um, you know, want to make this connection. So they go on this road trip to, vi to visit the, the grave of Lady Evelyn Kobold and they kind of see uh, a connection with her and that this connection um, um, is about them beginning to feel that Scotland is their home and, you know, having a, a kind of a, a making roots within uh, Scotland. And um, so th this this novel was very much so for, for all the time I was writing the novel, I was very much aware of of uh, and enjoying this process of connecting these uh, these three Muslim women who had come from different you know parts of the world and connecting them to Scotland and kind of the, rooting them somehow to uh, a Scottish uh, tradition. So uh, that was a, a good experience for me. <laughs> Did you feel like that a lot of your own experience? Yes, I mean this is certainly reflected a book. in this story particularly. Yeah, I mean this is uh, this is a book that I couldn't have written twenty years ago, um, and uh, it was it w I could have only written it uh, now. So it was very much as a result of of all the years that I lived uh, here. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. I love that idea about. Um... This is a book that I couldn't have written 20 years ago, but it's a, a book that I'm writing now because, again, with like my top secret stuff that I don't tell anyone, but I'm obviously telling you. <laughs> um, but there is this sense because that that's so much about faith. And I think my relationship to faith being such a journey. But I think there really is this sense of um, that, you know, that personal processing of where you are and then where that comes into your writing. So, yeah, I love that reflection um, Layla, about what books you can write um, in terms of where you are. Yeah, you're not the same person. I mean, and, no. no. So when I was like, when I was reading this bit from the translator, it was my first book and I was writing it. I wrote it in 90, started 97, 98, and then it got published in 99. And, and it's just like so long time ago and it's not me. And, and, and but it's, it's <laughs> so it is, it is amazing how these books are, you know, so much a part of their time and a part of who you are at that time yeah 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 is there any kind of writing that you hope your future self will do or will sort of explore um Nadine do you want to go for it <laughs> it's like looking at each other <laughs> um sure my future I think yeah, so I think there's two thoughts in my mind. And one of them is almost like a question back to Layla about like exactly what you were saying about, you know, we we write these books as our like present selves, but then we become our future selves who are like reading our past selves. And it's like this whole thing. And it's also like how you how you balance that within yourself and your own anxieties too, you know, because there's there's a, you know, you look and you think, oh, there's a typo, but also you're like, gosh, you know, but I'm writing differently or I'm feeling differently or whatever. So I think it's really, I think it's a really interesting conversation as writers in general about time and writing and, and being published. Um, but I think in terms of my future self, I just feel this sense of like, um, you know, the current work that I'm doing just now, feeling so true to my specific experience just now. Um, and then, but I will be a different person when, you know, when other people read this work, should we say, like, I will be a different person. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting. And I think part of me is just feeling that I've got to actually respect it and see it as that and see it as almost like this writing or this book is, is a time capsule or this communication of, of a person captured exactly in that, that moment of time or place. Um, it's something I think about a lot. Yeah. Mm. Leila? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I I would like to write um, nonfiction. I actually find it very difficult to do that to write essays. I'm always writing fiction, and I just I can't get the voice. I I can't get a, a nonfiction voice going. So maybe in, in in the future I might be able to to do that. I hope. Yeah, that sounds good. Is there anything you'd like to tell your past writing self as you're writing your books and poems? Oh, I have so much to say to my past self. <laughs> I, 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 the biggest mistake I made 
was that I, I used to send stuff out and then wait for the reaction. Mm. And that was such a waste of time. Or if I get a negative review, I'd kind of like, you know, uh, you know, get upset for ages. So I feel I wasted a lot of time, whereas I could have written more if I had just, um, you know, just kept, uh, kept kind of uh, going. So I guess that's, that's probably the advice I would have given myself. Yeah, that's good advice. <laughs> Yeah, I think similarly, there's definitely something about believing, believing in myself, um, I guess, in the past. Um, there's definitely that one typo. And let me tell you this, the one typo, <laughs> <laughs> like past self, this page. <laughs> um, but also, I think, you know, there's, there's something nice as well about like, especially, you know, this year with the context that we've all been in. And I think it can it can knock your resilience in some ways, you know, when we are in, in such isolated circumstances. And so there's something about me I actually feel like quite proud of my past self you know because I feel like to write a poetry collection that was so honest and so political but so personal at the same time was actually quite brave <laughs> um so yeah I think I would actually say you know what you're like really brave and you don't even realize how brave you are um yeah <laughs> um so another question would be what was an early experience where you had learned that writing or your writing specifically had power Layla, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I haven't thought about the, 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 that. Um, I actually, oh yeah, something made me very happy. There was a conversation on, on Twitter about a, a, a Sudanese rest, uh, cafe in Edinburgh. And this, this person was asking this other person, uh, where is this Nile Cafe? I've been there once. And then somebody was saying, oh, I don't know. And then the other person said, uh, Leila Bolela mentioned it in a story. And then they, they kind of went on and I was like, oh, wow. That, that <laughs> felt like it was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that I was just kind of mentioned in passing. And how did I find out about that? Of course, is because I searched for myself. <laughs> <laughs> We all do it. We all do it. Yes. So that was quite, that was a, a nice surprise that I felt that I had somehow, that I could be mentioned in a conversation just like that. When it wasn't about me, it was about something else. And, and uh, I thought I, I liked that. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had conversations with people when they've reflected on your stories um, and your writing and how it's impacted them? Any stories that really resonated with you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. A lot of people do say that. And, and you know, they, they say that, they, you know, they relate to it or they I, I like I, I do. I do like these uh, these stories. And um, uh, I remember once reading a review by someone and he said uh, even this hard hearted atheist was moved by this book or something. And I thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> Not on the book. Yes. <laughs> Nadine, have you had similar experience with your writing? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I think, I think that, you know, and I think it's how we think about power in like, um, in different ways, you know, like, I think when in terms of when I first realised that my book was a powerful collection, or that, that I, I had power as a poet, I guess, was in, you know, in that more like, structural or career way was when I got like recognitions, like when Jackie Kay, you know, the Macca sort of praised it when it was shortlisted for the Edwin Morgan. And so those are like, okay, so you've got power in terms of that context, um, like as realizing that I could actually be a poet, you know, that kind of like, you can actually be that. Um, but then I think in terms of, you know, there's that personal power as well of being like, you know, I've I've met myself on the page or I've met some of my my biggest wounds or vulnerabilities on the page you know and I think that's a very different kind of power um but again I think something about when I wrote some of my most honest poetry on the page and just coming to that I think was a moment of great power to me even if it's a moment that nobody else will ever ever see you know it's a moment that was just with myself and then definitely in terms of relationships with readers um you know people who especially when I first started reading my poetry um, in public for the first time and people who would come up to me afterwards and be like, oh my gosh, you know, that resonated much, so much for me, um, you know, and, and that way of connection, because when I write, I'm writing just for myself, you know, that's how, how my work starts. And so then when people come up and say, oh gosh, but that meant something to me too, 
you know, at first it's a bit of a world spinner because you're like, whoa, okay, you know, like, and then afterwards you suddenly realize that how lovely that is to have that connection with people and, and to have that connection with readers. And I know I was um, doing a, a podcast earlier in lockdown and the person said sort of after as an aside, um, you know, that something, something, something um, had happened. And then they, they went and watched my poem Hopscotch and they were like, and then I suddenly remembered I was less alone. And it was just like, oh gosh, yes, this is why we do it. This is why we do what we do and why we take all of our hearts and put them on the page for, for moments like this, you know? Writing's quite, it's an emotional process. Um, so how do you deal with sort of the emotional impact of writing about something personal to you and then sharing it with everyone? Nadine? It's <laughs> a good question. <laughs> Um, you know, I think, how do I do with the emotional impact of writing things down and then, and then sharing them with someone else? I think on the one hand, I think it's, it's about, I think it's more about how you feel about yourself as well at any given time. Because I think depending on where you're at, how you feel about that sharing is going to feel different. So like, it, like I said earlier, you know, like I look back and I think, gosh, that was really brave that I did that. Um, whereas at the time, I, you know, I might have felt differently. So I think it's really about actually, if you're coming from a place that, you know, being at peace with yourself in, in whatever way, then, you know, it's going to affect how you feel about that positively. Um, and I think for me, sometimes I'm like, oh, my gosh, that is really vulnerable. Do you just want to share it or do you not want to share it? I think, well, you don't have to. You don't have to share it if you don't want to. You can sit on it. You can put it in a drawer like something's value doesn't lie in only ever being shared. Um, but if you do want to because it means something to you to share that, because sharing that feels important to you, then, then you can as well. And just trusting myself in whatever decisions that I make and trusting that I will, you know, um, be able to be at, at peace with that in, in whichever way it goes. If in the future I feel, oh, that is really vulnerable. Or if in the future I feel, oh gosh, I wish I'd been more open, you know, just trusting the decisions that I made in that moment and that I knew what was right for, for me. Very beautiful, I like that. Oh, um, and Leila, I know you said you have quite a structural approach to your writing. Do you ever get quite emotional when you're writing? I do get emotional when I'm writing, but there is still a, a distance. I mean, I'm I don't want to be like looking. I think if I if I start looking over my shoulder and starting to think, what will people think of me and all that? Uh, I don't think this is, it will make the writing very self conscious. So um, I. Um, I do kind of separate that. And I do feel that that what people think about the work is more important than what they think about me. So mm -hmm. somehow I'm not important anymore. If the work is more important uh, than me. And I guess it's easier to, 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 to maintain this as you, as you kind of get older and as you kind of like, you're no longer, um, um, you know, really looking for connect connections that much with with people it's more that that you're you're wanting the work to be the work uh, as kind of separate from 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 my, myself um and i've always felt that I've, I've never felt because it's so fictional because i don't write i think that's the that's the thing about not writing the non-fiction because with the non-fiction i would then have to be myself and i actually don't know that i don't know what how that will be I think that would be very vulnerable and that would be very, um, you know, uh, d difficult uh, to, to do, I, I think. Yeah. <laughs> do you think it's still something that you'd be interested in doing some nonfiction? We're going to hold you to it. I, know. <laughs> yes, I think I do. I do. I mean, I wrote once a piece for The Guardian and there was this huge backlash and there was all these people writing horrible things and, 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 and you know, and you think, well, do I really want that? And, and somehow when you write fiction, that doesn't happen either because these people don't read it. I mean, that is an interest, interesting itself. Why is it if I, I wrote a piece for The Guardian, which, which was about um, Islamophobia and about young people being, you know, um, you know being targeted and being uh, held under suspicion and, and, and so on. Um, and and the, this, all these people were, you know, saying angry things. But then if I write a novel and in a novel I am expressing the same sentiment, I don't get this uh, backlash. So either it's not the same people or somehow uh, uh, when you present something as fiction, it's more gentle, it's less conf confrontational. People are willing to kind of like uh, listen to a fictional voice uh, rather than if you 
come across in a non-fictional um, way. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Nadine, do you have anything to say on that as well? I think there's. I think it's it's nice for me to reflect on that from. Um, almost turning it on its head and reflecting on it from the process of writing as someone who writes a lot of nonfiction and draws from their life and sometimes feeling like gosh I wish I was more of a fiction writer um, so that it, it didn't feel so um, you know exposing or vulnerable or you know like even though exactly as Layla says which is exactly right that you know you you can put all of these things into fiction you know I think there's something about when I've been writing stuff that feels really um personal of almost wishing like gosh I, I wish I had almost I wish I had fiction around me almost like this protective security blanket where if someone did then come and say oh so you know xyz has happened to you I could be like oh no no that's just the <laughs> that's just the story <laughs> you know um whereas there's there's not much to hide behind um but there's also something that I find in the way that I write non-fiction quite freeing as well on the other side of being able to express uh, the curiosities of how I live my life and you know a lot of the work that I've been doing recently um, has it, it you know is non-fiction but has these really strong elements of almost like magical realism because that is how I experience my life um, and I find something in that really freeing and really beautiful as well so yeah. I really like that you experience magical realism in your life yeah. as well I think we all do in our own small ways you know I think we all have these little things you know um, whether it's like a leaf falling to the ground at a particular time or whatever that that feel like moments of deep connection and, and that comes out in my writing which I really love really like that yeah. um, so as we're talking a lot about the future I'm wondering what kind of stories do you think the world needs more of in the future Leila do you have any um... ideas of stories or themes that people need to be reading more about? Well, I think people need, need to be reading more about, um, you know, um, simpler lifestyles. I think that with, with the pandemic and with the, cli the, you know, the climate crisis, uh, we are now kind of, uh, we, we're going to be kind of moving away from this jet setting, you know, high consumption lifestyle. And, and maybe we need to, you know, go back to living a more simple lifestyles, closer to the earth, closer to nature. And, um, and, and it, it, it surprises me, actually, that young people uh, don't have basic skills. I mean, they, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to sew. They don't know how to, um, you know, uh, cook from scratch. They don't know how to wash in a tub or, you know, the, all these things. I think it would be good for us to uh, to, to see these skills, whether in uh, uh, whether in fiction or nonfiction or in films or you know just somehow to to, to be back in touch with um, uh, with a kind of uh, uh, a survivor instincts which we don't have. We're very molly coddled in 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 the, in the modern world. <laughs> Are there any books that you've been reading um, over the past few months that you felt have really resonated with you or? brought you hope oh everything I'm very hopeful I'm a very helpful per person I'm not uh, <laughs> I don't uh, d despair or anything I think uh, you know I think people are very resilient I think people are very uh, human beings are creative I think um, you know everything um, is happens for a, for a reason everything has a meaning everything has a lesson for us to learn and uh, I think that, um, you know, we, we will come out of this uh, a lot uh, stronger, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and Nadine, is there any kind of stories that you think the world needs more of in the future? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, I would, I would like more stories where it's people sort of like, um, I want to say you do you, <laughs> which isn't quite right, but where it's people like really expressing them themselves or their writing or however they want to relate to their craft in their own unique way because I think for me you know I came I was writing poetry when I was working full-time in a different sector you know so I, I wasn't coming from um you know I didn't do a creative writing degree or anything like that and so I'd write poems like like hopscotch which is a poem which is like all the words are spread all over the page and I didn't know if you were allowed to write poems like that you know all the all the poetry that I was exposed to at school was very much one way and I didn't know if 
how I did it in the way that was natural and instinctive to me if that was allowed um and so I think what I what I want to see in the future is more um yeah more people being able to engage with art in a way that feels right and authentic to them without worrying about all oh, these permissions because I think actually it's going to bring so much more um exciting and rich artworks you know um and, and just really wonderful ways of of playing with form or narrative or, or telling you stories in new ways and yeah I so I, I think that's what I want to see in the future um and so for example I mean this isn't necessarily over the past couple of years I've been reading verse novels um, and just again it's completely opening things up for me in a in a new way you know and that was something that I'd not been exposed to as a reader before um, so yeah that's that's like one small example. <laughs> I like that. Is there anyone over the past few months that you've been reading that you found really resonated with you? Yeah so if if anybody follows me on Instagram they know that I really read a lot of like YA and like children's literature um like a lot a lot but, and especially this year you know I think some of the most beautiful ways books can give us so much different things you know connection and peace and and for me but also that like wonderful escapism of when you're like reading a really good book and you're just totally in it and you're totally there and this year I've really been prioritizing that experience um so a couple of ones that were just like oh, yes um, was there's one called Legend Born by Tracy Dion um again like young adult lit and one called Empire of Sand by Tasha Suri and both of them it was just like you know it's like 11 o'clock at night and you're, you're just like reading um, and yeah I just I, I love that about books because it takes me back to being a child and like you know going to my local library and just working my way along the shelf and just loving reading and I think that's such a beautiful thing. I think that really resonates with me as well I've been reading a lot of just the fun things that I really really enjoy and I can just escape into at night and lot of YA yeah. as well so yeah. oh, it's good stuff why it. <laughs> <laughs> um so one of my last questions is you both tend to write from a feminist perspective um so how would you like to see the future of women's lives in Scotland and other parts of the world Layla would you like to I don't know <laughs> Do you don't big to... question <laughs> it's a big question <laughs> I'm interested in how people are saying that the pandemic has has made women like more at home and more like um, looking after the children and 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 kind of being like a um, a step backwards in, in in women's lives. So I find that a, quite an intriguing thing, and I'm wondering whether you know whether that will hold out uh, till the end or whether it's just a, a just an anxiety, just just part of the anxiety, and, and things will go back to normal again. Nadine? Um, so for the future of, of women, I guess, broadly, I guess the word that's come into mind is freedoms. Um, wanting freedoms for women, almost in the same way as I was thinking about that freedom for expression as a writer. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking some, that there's something about freedoms, because I think actually especially when we're looking intersectionally at different experiences for different women um, and the sort of hatreds that we've seen, you know, and, and the violence this year, you know, for example, Breonna Taylor, um, you know, who was murdered, I think this, that is not, that is not freedom. Um, and so I think there's, for me, freedom would be an important thing that women are free to live their lives without hatred or persecution of oppression um and especially this year in terms of like I say black lives matter um hatred towards trans women all of these things i think that isn't freedom and i want women to have freedom so yeah that's a really big question Thank you, Nadine. it was just to throw that in at the end I'm, I'm curious is there anything that you'd like to ask each other anything you're curious about each other's writing i know there's a book on your shelf nadine from layla Wait, can I, yeah. I need to get my <laughs> <laughs> so there we go there we go <laughs> yeah I wanted to ask Nadine how she uh, started to write and if this was something that she's knew knew from when she was young that she wanted to be a poet yeah I think when I was young I don't think I knew you were allowed to be a poet mm -hmm. um you know I think I 
it's almost like being a celebrity, right? You just don't think it would ever happen to you. And it, it certainly was never presented as like a, a career choice. Um, but I think I always was a poet. Like I used to, actually my first published poem, I don't think anybody knows this. So this is like a Buckwheat Scotland exclusive. My first published poem was when I was like 10 years old in like an Amnesty International uh, newsletter, you know? Um, yeah. And so I think there was, I always knew it within myself, but I think I needed that permission, I guess. Um, and so I, you know, like I said, I, when I became a published poet, I was I was working in a different sector, but I think that sector gave me so much experience that I draw on as a poet. You know, you we are more than just one thing, right? Um, what about you, Leila? Uh, well, I had I had uh, always loved reading, uh, but then I didn't start to write until I came to Scotland. So it was really the move, you know, from Sudan to to, to Aberdeen. And finding it so different, and uh, and wanting to express that, you know, the difference and the uh, my homesickness, and, and so I started to write. So I started to write rather late. I was uh, about maybe uh, twenty eight years old when I when I started to write. So it's a bit a bit late. <laughs> But it was also inspired by being um, having access to the Aberdeen Central Library and going to the library. It was very exciting to suddenly, uh, you know, have this, you know, burst of words coming out. It was really quite an exciting time. So. I was 24. So I feel like we were we were both okay, in the same. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Even though apparently some people think I'm still like sort of 24, 25 now. And I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> time traveling. Well, I think that's everything that we have time for today. So thank you, Nadine and Leila, for joining us. Um, is there you. anything last that you would like to say? No, it's just think... it's, it's being very nice to have this uh, the, the discussion and it's it's always nice to have the opportunity to, to you know speak about the faith and, and spirituality yeah yeah and thank you so much for having us and I almost feel like we should end on a question back to you Jill about you know what your hope is for the future or what kind of one word you would use to bring that together I would say to bring it to the theme of Scottish Interfaith Week which I think is really important is connecting I think we need to find more ways to connect with each other um, and find things that we have in common and also things that we have that are different that we can embrace and celebrate together. Um, I think that's really what I would be looking for is more ways to connect with each other and things that we can connect about. That's true. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you for sharing your views on faith, future and connection. Um, it's been wonderful to hear about your experiences and influences in your writing. Um, so this Book Week Scotland event has been brought to you by Scottish Book Trust and Interfaith Scotland. Scottish Book Trust wants everyone living in Scotland to have equal access to books because better access to books means better life chances. You can help by gifting a book to a family who is struggling this Christmas. If you've enjoyed this event, please consider sharing your love of reading with others by making a donation to Scottish Book Trust's Christmas Appeal at scottishbooktrust.com. If you'd like to learn more about interfaith dialogue, education and engagement, then please visit interfaithscotland.org. Thank you for coming.